Are we doing good so far? Was, oh my goodness, I, I was going to ask the question, but it's so, so good to just slow down a little bit. And um, I, would, I guess I would call it marinating in God's presence. And so I don't know about you, but my understanding of marinating is the longer it marinates, the more it tastes like what it's marinating in. I just want to smell like Jesus. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Speaking of smells, um, I don't know if any of y'all have ever done this when maybe, maybe you've done this on, on a date or something, but, um, and really this isn't even a date. This is just going out. So maybe this will resonate with some of you. I don't connect with makeup stores. I just don't. I don't, I'm not drawn to them. I'm not, I don't like, Ooh, land co- I'm not, I just don't. Um, one of summer's favorite stores to go to when, with regard to makeup is Ulta or Lancome. And, um, the only way that I make that fun for myself is I, while she's distracted in like the latest deals that I will hear about later on, like, look at all this stuff I got. I'm like, that's so exciting. And, um, I will slide over to the cologne section and, and I will just out of curiosity, I just want to see what things smell like. And so I will begin to cover my body with all the other aromas, all the aromas that I can find. And then um, I will purposefully walk behind her. I've done this a few times, so she's caught on now. But I will walk behind her so she can't smell my wafts until we get to a closed-in section, like our car. And so um, <laughs> I'll just pop in the car, and then she gets in the car, and she's like, Oh, my gosh! What did you do? And she's like, roll down the window. And just, it's just a scene, right? Um, well, we're going to talk about aroma today. Hopefully not in that um, atrocious of a way, but just a, a really genuinely sweet moment that once again we're going to go to this lady, this young woman called Mary. And we learn from her once again today in this conversation of posture patterns. So we um, are not going to douse ourselves with various colognes and perfumes, but we are going to rest in his presence and hopefully rest in this one story that um, is so, so sweet and precious. And so um, if you would, we're going to read it twice. Um, John and Mark... Um, share this story with us. I believe it's Mark 14 and then Luke, uh, or not Luke, but John 12 and then Mark 14. And we're going to, I'm going to try to be really concise with my time and um, there's going to be some of this that we trailblaze, but I want to read this story for us this morning twice and then we're going to pick it apart. Starting in John chapter 12, it goes like this. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was. Bethany is not a person, but it's a place. Um, and, and Lazarus is the one that Jesus has raised from the dead. Verse 2 says, they, so they, they gave a dinner for him there. Martha, not surprising, was serving them. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary, the younger sister took a pound of fragrant oil, pure expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. I was curious about this scent. I I couldn't afford to buy one pound of this oil. And sadly, I left it in my car at the house this morning. But Throughout the week, as I was studying this verse, I would just dab my finger on this little jar of oil and just put it under my my nose just to to get a sense of what filled this home. And I guess it just depends on what you like, what smells you like. I think it's it's a very um, complex smell, and and it's you know you're smelling something when you breathe in and and smell this this oil 
One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, and I love how John says this, who was about to betray him. Mark is a little bit more tactful with it. Um, Judas said, why wasn't this fragrant oil sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and he was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of what was put in it. It's like, okay, John, we get it. You did not like Judas. Like this is for all of history to read, right? And this is what John writes about Judas. And Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And then real quick, we're going to jump over to Mark chapter 14. It's almost the same, but there's just a few additional pieces to this. And so Mark 14 verse 3 reads like this. And so while he was in Bethany at the house, now we know whose house it is, at the house of Simon, who had a serious skin disease, And Jesus, he was reclining at the table, and a woman, now we know that it is Mary, Mary came with an alabaster jar of pure and expensive fragrant oil of nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head, but some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this fragrant oil been wasted? For this oil might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they began to scold her. And then Jesus says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you and you can do what is good for them whenever you want, but you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. I assure you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. Okay, in really fast fashion, we're going to look at three things, provided we have the the time and I'm responsible with the time. When it comes to posture patterns, here are three things to pay attention to out of these two accounts of Mary anointing Jesus' feet. A humble spirit. If you lack a humble spirit, you will never find yourself at the feet of Jesus, ever, because your heart is not compelled to do so. If you walk this life full of pride and arrogance as if you know and have all of the answers, you will never find yourself at the feet of Jesus. And not only that, a humble spirit is, is where we begin with a true heart of worship. Isn't it fascinating? I don't know if you've been keeping record of this, or maybe you've read through Mark, maybe you've read through John, and, and there's another account of Mary in Luke. Three times, we have three different moments that are spoken about when it comes to Mary and Jesus. I find it extremely fascinating that each account she is at Jesus feet. When he showed up at their house, she sat at his feet as a disciple to hear from him while his, her sister was busying around, right? The next one, Lazarus died. Jesus appeared to be late on the scene. Martha, I'm, I, I, I um, think this is really interesting. Martha is the one that runs out to Jesus and pleads that, that like, why are you late? If you were here, he would have been, he would have, he would still be alive. Jesus stays there. Martha goes back to Mary. Mary is with people who are consoling her because of the pain of, of loss. And, and, and Martha says, Mary, Jesus is calling you. And so at the knowledge of Jesus calling her, Mary runs, doesn't say anything to the ladies who are there, or to the people that are there. She just bolts. And they're like, maybe she's going to the tomb. So they follow her, but she ends up not at the tomb where Lazarus was, but at the feet of Jesus. When Jesus called her, it led her to his feet. And then this last account here, there's this scene happening that we will talk about in a little bit more detail And regardless of all the festivities that are going on, she 
is at his feet. So if you're into, uh, I don't, I guess you call this alliteration or something where the letters, the, the words start with a D. To begin with, she is a disciple at Jesus' feet. The next one at Lazarus' death, she is showing her dependence on Jesus. And then anointing Jesus' feet, she is showing extravagant devotion. Whether you're a disciple or dependent or devoted to Jesus, his feet, at his feet is our posture. We also see from this an understanding heart. This was a happy gathering. If you're unfamiliar with Passover and what was mean, this goes all the way back to Moses when, when God instructed the children of Israel to put, uh, to swipe blood on their doorposts and wherever the death angel saw that blood on the doorpost, he would pass over that home and death would not come on that home. And so we're talking thousands of years. They have been observing Passover and it is a celebration. God, thank you for sparing our life. And so, masses of people are gathering around the city to observe the Passover. And it is a time of celebration. And so Jesus is in this gathering. Lazarus had been raised from the dead. Clearly Simon, who had a skin disease, doesn't have a skin disease anymore. And it's a party going on. And without announcement, this girl with a one-pound jar of oil discreetly pours out oil on Jesus' feet. Why would she do that? Even in the throes of this festive time, Mary senses anguish in Jesus. You can write this one down, Luke 1150, or it's either 1150 or 1250. You do the homework. But Jesus said of himself that I am fixated on what I'm about to be baptized into. It overwhelms me. I am overcome by it. And so there's something of a perception and discernment and understanding that Mary had that even in this party scene, she could see to the heart of Jesus that what he was about to step into was causing him anguish and though she does not have, there's, there's no way that she has the full understanding of what she's doing, that she is, that she's anointing him for burial. Not until he says it. It's just an act of devotion from her standpoint. Here, here, here's something that's worth saying, that's worth drawing our attention to. When we establish a pattern of being postured at Jesus' feet, we begin to understand and feel what he feels. That's what compelled Mary to do what she did is because she felt the way Jesus felt. Had she not been at his feet as a disciple, had she not been at his feet when Lazarus died out of desperation, she she wouldn't get it. And so if you, if we find ourselves having a hard time to, to, to land it, like, God, wh- where's your heartbeat at? We won't hear his heartbeat if we are never at his feet. And so you're going to perpetually miss what is important to him because we're distracted. It's interesting that at his feet, we hear his heart. So I like playing this out a little bit more. That no matter the gathering or the company that we are in, our actions are a result of our heart being synchronized with Jesus. And I love how Mary, she's not flashy. She's not attention seeking like, hey y'all, it's a great party. I got this bottle of nard. I'm going to crack it open and pour it out. on Like there was no announcement. And yet her act was discreet obviousness. Our actions, when we are at the feet of Jesus, when we are postured that way, our actions are a display of extravagant devotion, 
Which, by the way, no different than this story here, there are skeptics. There are skeptics of right posture. I just want you to understand that, that there are going to be, I don't, I don't know why we, we throw this around, but naysayers. Nay, nay. Nay on what you're doing. There's going to be people who are like, they just don't get it. They're like, this could have been used in a more sensible way. Rather than pouring this out on our future Savior, why didn't you sell it and give it to the poor? It doesn't, it won't, it won't add up. It won't add up to those who don't stay at the feet of Jesus. So our life goal is to not act out of the acceptance of what others will, or, or the approval of what others might think, but to follow the heartbeat of Jesus, period. And yes, this is a one-time extravagant act, like that jar of nard, who knows how long it was sitting on a shelf or in a cabinet in their home waiting for that day, that time. When we are at the feet of Jesus, it's, an, it's a display of extravagant devotion. There's also a sweet aroma. And we live in this lane of selfless servitude that is discreet obviousness. Have you ever seen gentleness cut the atmosphere of a room like a knife? That's, that's what Mary is doing here. This is a happy gathering. And that, the atmosphere is sliced by this discreet act of worship. Man, I want that for my life. Where I don't, I don't have to join the chaos. But I want to hear Jesus' heartbeat and act and live accordingly. And then the last thing that we can look at here is there is a generational ripple. Please do not underestimate the long-term value and necessity of being at the feet of Jesus. If, if arrogance and pride keeps you from being at the feet of Jesus, you are shortening the narrative that is going to be um, spoken of about your life. I don't know how to word that, but, but arrogance is like an ax to your effectiveness. Arrogance and pride is an axe to your fruitfulness. What did Jesus say? Can we, I, I do this sometimes, can we trust what Jesus says? Is he, is he ever like um, embellishing or, or being exaggerated at all? Listen to what he says in Mark. I assure you, the one who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that one says, I assure you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the world, what this woman has done will also be told in memory of her. So I have a question for you this morning. Right now, what stories of extravagant devotion will be shared about you? If it's in short supply, I have one destination to encourage you to get to. And that is at the feet of Jesus. It's only from the feet of Jesus that we can hear his heart. It's only from the feet of Jesus that we are um, compelled, prompted, led, guided to that place of selfless servitude. Everything starts at the feet of Jesus. That was a really fast flyby, right? Okay, y'all good with all of that? Can we do this? Can we just like, in your mind, just like gather all of that 
tie it together with a nice rope around it, just bring all of those things together, the discreetly obvious, extravagant devotion, living unaffected by critics and skeptics, and, and, and living with such humility that continuously leads us to the feet of Jesus. Let's just bear hug those four things and talk about this next week. Because what we've been doing over the last several weeks is we've been talking about posture patterns. And if we want to see our life transformed, if we want to see our homes, our marriage, our identity transformed, if we want to see our workplace transformed, if we want to see our community transformed, where it begins is at the feet of Jesus. So it is not by accident that our first week of decrease has to do with our posture. Because if you have a hard time, if we have a hard time with this one, we're going to have a hard time with all of them. And can I just go ahead and speak to some whatever colored animal is the obvious one in the room, okay? The white elephant. I guarantee you right now there is somebody sitting in here that says, I don't, I don't do this. This isn't my... My family knows that I don't do this. So I'm going to start now? Yeah. That's precisely what we're doing. So what is it that we're doing? I've been teasing us on this for the last couple weeks. We are going to begin and end each day on our knees at the feet of Jesus. Um, the, The team is going to be walking up and down the aisles um, because I don't want us just to be, go ahead and start handing these out, because I don't want us to just mindlessly and awkwardly be kneeling down at our bedside. And so we took some time to create a little guide to help in the morning and in the evening. I want to ask Hannah if you'll come on up here. Um, me and Hannah are the uh, first to get up in the morning, provided Olivia wakes us up. Um, but Hannah and I wake up in the morning, and so I, I told her, I kind of primed her throughout the week, and I reminded her this morning, I was like, hey, just so you know, this is what we're going to do this week. Um, because we're the first ones up in the house, you and I are going to be at your bedside and walk through this pattern of posturing ourselves at Jesus' feet. Do we have our sweet? This this is not what um, our bedroom looks like at all. Um, the the hope and the heart behind doing this has everything to do with our heart. Has everything to do with developing a pattern of humility. In Jesus' presence. This is more, I guess it's a little bit deeper than just acknowledgement, but it is, it is basically declaring from our knees, Jesus, this is all you and this is all for you. So I know everybody, for the most part, unless you're super, super young, you you can read. I, I get it. But I want to demonstrate what our morning is going to be like this next week. And whatever time you wake up, maybe you have swing shifts and whatnot, the point is, when you get out of bed or when you get into bed, do this. All right? So good morning, Hannah. I love you. I don't wake her up like that. (laughs) I'm going to have you come up here by the foot of the bed. And um, I'm going to talk about these in a minute. Go ahead and take your knee or take knees, whichever. Just get on your knees. <laughs> I'm going to talk about these knee pads in a second, but they are intentionally placed by the bed on the nightstand. How you doing? Good. Do you sleep good? Mm-hmm. Do you have any dreams? I do ask them that every day, if they have any dreams. You didn't have any dreams? No, oh, I did, and they, were, they didn't make any sense. <clears throat> What we're going to do starting off this week is before we go through this prayer, 
we're just going to be quiet in God's presence, okay? And in that time, what I like to encourage is, or what I try to do is just imagine myself sitting with my heavenly dad and, and just enjoying his presence. So for me, I'm sitting at the end of a pier with my feet dangling over the side and um, just sitting with my dad. And so we'll do that for a few minutes, okay? Um, and if, it's, if, if it feels forced, it's because we don't do it regularly. If it feels strange, it's no different than working out. You're going to feel muscles that you didn't previously feel. Don't let that be a trigger for you to stand up and be like, okay, I'm done. I tried it, can't do it, I'm done. But rather, wherever it feels different or odd, let that be your cue to continue in it. So we had our few minutes of just being quiet with, with our Heavenly Father. And so this morning, just to get us started, you can do tomorrow morning or maybe even tonight, but I'm going to pray this uh, prayer, okay? So Father... Thank you for waking us to a new day. You are gracious and compassionate. You are slow to anger and great in faithful love. You are good to everyone. Your compassion rests on all you have made. I know you will help when I fall, and I know that you are near when I call out. Today, I will be determined to live for you and to listen to you and to look for you. So I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And we may just have another moment or two of being, just resting in his presence. And it's that simple, y'all. And what I would encourage is to let five minutes on your knees be your starting place, but I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that you'll, you'll be surprised some morning when 20 minutes have gone by when you're just resting in his presence. And to start your day that way where you are, you're basically making these statements. Let me throw out a, a, a big word about who God is. You are sovereign. You, you are holy. I don't do a lot of bowing and kneeling, but when I do, it's for you. And before my day starts, this posture lets you know that I am giving it to you. And you'll be amazed, thanks Hannah, you'll be amazed at what that simple, Posture at the beginning and the ending of your day will do in your heart. And I know you can read, but let me read the evening one. Father, thank you. And this is regardless of how you slept. This is regardless of how well or not well your day went. Because what we are saying and what has been written on these cards is still true no matter what life delivers. Because I let me just say this. The air you're breathing, you didn't create it. So the very fact that you woke up with breath in your lungs is a gift. And it's not a gift to yourself. God gave you that. So if you have air going in and out of your lungs... There's nothing that he does without purpose or without reason. So live for the purpose and reason that he has in mind for your life. Here's the evening prayer. Father, thank you for being with me today. I give you all my cares and concerns. Right now I lean into your love and peace. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, God, make me live in safety. And then you crawl into your comfy bed or couch or whatever your preference is of sleeping and you rest in his presence. We're going to do this. We're starting this tonight. 
And by the way, if you are a guest with us today, this isn't like a sheet you have to sign and be like, okay, I'm in. This is just, just do this. I, we invite you to do this. And what we're going to do next week is give an opportunity. We're just going to put it on the, the grow card. Just if, if you're like, man, God showed me this this past week, or God did this in my heart, or God did this in my life. We, we want to hear about it. And next week, guess what we're going to do? What? <laughs> nothing flashy. Nothing crazy. I'm going to invite you to live out that posture every day. This is just the start of our weeks of decrease to increase. And just to answer the question, by the way, you're like, what are we decreasing in? We are decreasing in mindlessness and increasing in mindfulness. Amen? Because I don't know about you, but a whole lot more of my life is just me waking up and going to make coffee. But how profoundly different will our days be and will my days be if I wake up and look at my nightstand? And this is the grow card question for the day. I'm like all over the place. What will trigger your mind this week to begin and end your days kneeling at Jesus' feet? For me, I'm just really practical. I've got some knee pads that I'm going to put beside my pillow. I'm not going to put them under my bed because I won't see them. I'm going to put them either on the bed. I'll convince Summer that they're not sweaty and they won't contaminate the bed. But I'm going to put them somewhere (laughs) in visual sight so that it will remind me to begin and end my day postured at the feet of Jesus. So, grab your grow card. What will trigger your mind this week to begin and end your day kneeling at Jesus' feet? And, and um, it's kind of a funny day to, to receive these. Um, you might need to write it down twice. The reason why I want to receive these today is so that we can pray as a team over this week, okay? So maybe write it down on your, on your arm or something so that you remember what your trigger is going to be. But don't neglect identifying a reminder.